Thank you and good morning. Um, so this is uh, something that we've been looking forward to being able to share with you all um, around uh, some of the work that has been done around modeling and how it has informed not only how we're monitoring the progress of this pandemic in BC, but also how it's informed our planning and that's really important. And I will start with saying um, that this is modeling. So it is not a prediction. It's not a prediction of where we might be or how we might go. It's a set of parameters that allow us to make some rational decisions about planning. And as well, there's different types of modeling we're going to talk about this morning. And um, we'll get started with, uh, with working on this. So the first type of modeling that I'm going to talk about is around how do we know where we are compared to what other populations have happened around the globe. And uh, the BC CDC has done most of this work and it is uh, modeled around uh, what's happening in Canada, what's happening around the globe. And I will say that there's a slight um, chance of optimism perhaps that our rate of growth is being impacted by the measures that we've put in in the last couple of weeks but I'll show you um, I'll walk you through that so this uh, shows what we call a case rate comparison so rates mean numbers per population and what we're using here is uh, the the numbers of cases per million and we're comparing um, different jurisdictions. So this one, um, we pulled everybody back to when they first be, um, hit the rate of two per, per million population. And so for BC, that pulls us back to day one. We're a little bit ahead of the rest of Canada, and that's why the line for BC um, is a little bit farther ahead um, than the, the line for Canada. But as you can see, the lines for Spain and for Italy, Norway, Germany, some of the other countries have started to dramatically increase, usually around day seven, day eight. And what we're seeing here in BC and in Canada is that line has stayed relatively low. It is, of course, starting to increase and has been increasing about day 14 until now. And we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. What also you can see on this model is uh, South Korea, which also started increasing um, in the first couple of weeks and then flattened out. And that's what we need to, when we talk about flattening the curve or flattening, um, bending the curve, that's what we want to look at for BC. We don't want it to get that high, but that's what we've been talking about in terms of flattening the curve. We can also see that the United States is also behind in the time frame of since they reached two cases per million, at least reported two cases per million, and it is now starting to, to move dramatically increased as well. So that um, this modeling is based on uh, comparing what's happening in BC to hap what's happening in other countries and pulling it back so that we're all on the starting at the same time frame. And this uh, comparison looks at the cum cumulative numbers of cases. So these are the what we've been presenting every day. The number of people in BC who test positive for COVID-19. And it compares that to the number of cases that test positive in other parts of the world. And in this case, we've been looking at the how the outbreak um, uh, flowed through time in Hubei and in Italy. And again, um, this starts at when you've had 100 cases in that jurisdiction. The reason that we pull things down to 100 cases or two cases per million is because below that, when you have very small numbers, things can change very dramatically with just one or two numbers difference. It's what we call unstable. So we try and make it as, as reliable and as stable as possible so that we have an accurate comparison. And of course, that's one of the reasons why we haven't presented this data before now, these data before now, because we haven't had enough cases to be confident that this is actually meaningful. But right now, we are confident that this gives us a good sense of where we are in our trajectory right now in BC compared to these other jurisdictions. And as you can see, the, the dark red line is British Columbia, and we are trending up clearly, and we know that because we've had new cases every day, and those have increased in the last couple of weeks. Um, but we are maybe starting to, um, to bend a little bit here. 
I, I will say that this is based on cumulative cases. And as you know, our testing strategy has changed over the, uh, the last few weeks, where initially we were very focused on testing people who had come in from other countries so that we could detect when pe people were coming into the uh, BC and into Canada with this disease. We've now changed our strategy because we know that people who uh, are coming into BC have potentially been exposed to this and we know where their exposures are. So our testing strategy is focused on our community, on people who are getting um, infections in BC, and also on our healthcare system. Very specifically, we are looking at making sure we uh, detect any cases in our hospitals, in healthcare workers, and in long term care because we know those are where we can get outbreaks, where we can get transmission that can um, take out healthcare workers and our health facilities. So we've been very focused on making sure we understand what's happening in those facilities. Having said that, we have not stopped the volume of testing that we're doing. What we're doing is focusing it in on the highest risk populations and we've been doing 3,000 tests a day, um, more than um, many other jurisdictions and, and actually comparable to what we saw in, with a testing strategy in other countries like Singapore, like um, uh, South Korea. And I think that's important. So the second type of modeling that we're using, there's uh, uh, different, <laughs> lots of different types of models, but um, this is one that's looking at how, um, how is the change in BC happening over time. And it is looking at uh, the percent change or the daily increase, the trajectory that of the cases that we're seeing here in BC. We also are doing some what we call dynamic modeling that looks at impacts of measures that have been taken. But that modeling is still at a very early stage because we haven't, thankfully, had a lot of cases yet in BC. And we are still within the time frame of uh, implementation of some of the, the broad social measures that we've all been impacted by in the last few weeks. So I'm going to walk through this slide um, in a little bit of detail so you understand what I've been looking at quite intently every day for the last number of weeks. So the red line is what we are actually seeing in British Columbia right now. And as you can see, we started really, uh, this, is, this is again rates. So num numbers of cases per million in British Columbia. And we, on the 4th of March is when we started to reach that threshold of two cases per million in our province. As you can see, things um, grumbled along for a little while. And then around 14th, 15th of March is another really important day. So the, the 13th was when we announced travel restrictions, when we announced um, some of the major uh, um, orders that and restrictions on movement, and we started implementing the important physical distancing measures in our community. And that was because we realized that we were seeing transmission in the community that was not related to travel or to known cases. So uh, very early on, we put in some of these now, you know, very restrictive measures that we've been seeing um, put in place in countries around the world. So we, uh, I, I look at the 14th, 15th of March when schools were closed for March break, when we had these travel restrictions and implementations of, of our social distancing starting to get that message out. It is, of course, as we know, taken a couple of days for people to understand what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me as a business? How do we manage um, in, in groups like restaurants and bars? And as you know, we've restricted how they can work. We've restricted uh, certain businesses where you can't maintain those physical distances. Um, all of those implementations started the week of March 15th, 16th. So for me, when I'm looking at this curve, I know that there are people who were exposed to this virus prior to that date who are going to become sick in the 14 days after their exposure. So it is not surprising, and we've been seeing that in the last 10 days, we've started to see um, people becoming ill. What these important measures that we have put in place that all of us need to, to pay attention to, these distancing measures, we're going to start to see the impact of those in the coming week to two weeks. So the second incubation period from when they started. 
Um, so when we look at this graph, that's what we're starting to see in the red line. And, and I, I, I'm trying not to overcall it, but I do believe we've seen a flattening, a falling off of that curve. And we can look at the gray line, and as you can see, the gray line continues to go up. And so that is what the modelers think would have happened had we not put in some of the, the measures that we put in. So there are a couple of things. Our trajectory, so the, the progress that we're seeing, change from an increase of about 24% per day down to around 12% per day. So that's a slowing down of the numbers of new cases, which is good. And it's because of a whole variety of things. One is our changing testing strategy, but also um, you know, driven by our physical distancing and the important thing that everybody is paying attention to that physical distancing, as well as the restrictions in travel. So that other group of people that were continuing to come into BC, uh, having been exposed to this virus in other countries, that has also stopped. And that's made a difference in our trajectory as well. So that is the part that I'm going to be watching very, very carefully over the next coming weeks to months. And that's the part that we talk about when we're saying, you know, bending or flattening that curve. Um, finally, I will say, you know, that if we look at this, and, and these are, again, approximations or models, right now, um, we're, um, with our reported cases, we're about 130 cases per million population. If we had continued on the same trajectory that we had been on on the 14th of March, we would have expected to have about 215 cases per million. So we think that we've reduced that quite dramatically. What we need, though, is for everybody to continue to pay attention to these measures so that we can continue to prevent the transmission in our communities, continue to separate, to, to stop those chains of transmission in all of the settings in our communities for the coming weeks. And that's what we'll be watching um, going forward. And finally, just so you know, the, the blue line on there, uh, again, Canada as a whole was farther behind in, in reaching that two cases per million rate. And the blue line reflects what's happening um, across the country. And really, the, the steep inflection in the last few days has been because of the, the inclusion of a number of, of uh, uh, probable cases in Quebec that added to the total quite significantly. So this is the modeling that we've been using both to follow the trajectory that we have and now I'm going to turn it over to Minister Dix to look at some of the other models that we have put in place that have helped inform our planning. And again, I just want to say these are not predictions. They're actually using of data to help us um, plot a, a course that we can all get around and understand and understand how we might be able to respond to our pandemic as it evolves in BC. Oh, okay. I, sorry, I, I, there is one more slide that talks about our expected rates of growth and I, I've just talked about this. Um, there is value in our planning for these high responses and I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixon. Dr. Henry has control of the clicker today, which is a good thing uh, for everyone. Um, so I want to talk about, um, about our acute care capacity and uh, how uh, we are planning for various scenarios to deal with uh, the coming weeks and potentially months in British Columbia. I want to thank the people involved in this planning. It's an extraordinary group. Dr. Henry talked about the team, mostly at the BCCDC, which was involved in the modeling. We we're also talking about uh, a provincial critical care working group that has come uh, forward to deal with, with what we need, our projections and what we need here in British Columbia of over 20 medical directors, executive leads and clinical specialists responsible for ICUs and high acuity, acuity units, along with the epidemic modeling team from the BCCDC. And, the, and an operational capacity modeling team that has assessed uh, our capacity as a province against four scenarios, South Korea, Hubei, Northern Italy, cases, and Northern Italy hospitalizations. The reason we have done two for Northern Italy and made two preparations for Northern Italy is to uh, deal with the most severe version, which is focused on hospitalizations in Northern Italy, which has been the subject of some discussion in BC and elsewhere in the coming, uh, in the previous week. 
I wanted to also say that uh, this assessment, the full assessment, because this will be a short version of that assessment, is going to be uh, made available in a technical briefing. Uh, to the, it was available this morning to a technical briefing. It's fully going to be on the BCCDC website. So all of the, the, the information that was available and made available this morning will be available to everyone in the public. The assessment really has, uh, has uh, two areas of focus. The first is uh, focus on our current capacity with respect to cr cl critical care spaces capacity and our current capacity with respect to ventilators for critically ill patients. That cohort of patients that will require critical care and uh, the model assumes that that would be roughly 4.7 percent of patients. And the second is a focus on current hospital bed capacity for less acute patients requiring hospital care which is also hospital capacity. That is a larger group of people between 13 and 14 percent of patients. And so if you go to the next uh, chart, you'll see uh, models uh, based on a South Korea type epidemic, a Hubei type uh, epidemic, a North Italy, Northern Italy type epidemic uh, uh, involving overall number of patients, and a Northern Italy uh, type uh, epidemic based on a hospital based scenario. And you see the different lines as they go forward. The one in red at the bottom is South Korea. I note the star. If you look at it in, on this chart, that is British Columbia where we are today uh, based on the work of our epidemiologists. So if you look at those numbers, you'll see the trajectory in South Korea, then the trajectory in Hubei province, which I remind everyone was a very, very serious uh, epidemic indeed, which is uh, still proceeding but coming down the slope here. Uh, the, the one higher in mauve is uh, in the light mauve, I think it, you'd call that, or purple, is uh, northern Italy uh, based, on, uh, based on, ca critical, uh, on, on critical care patients. And then the final one is uh, uh, the uh, northern Italy, which is the hospital-based scenario. You'll note that the last two, of course, have not finished because they've not fully peaked. And so those are in terms of the planning and on the side. You're seeing uh, what that would mean for patients in British Columbia based on those various models. Uh, the next slide uh, addresses our ventilator capacity. So we've told you we have 1,272 ventilators currently, or we did uh, last week when we reported out on the number of ventilators in BC. But we're using conservative models there. Some of those ventilators are used, for example, for transport, and we're certainly going to need those ventilators. But the focus here is on, uh, on our current inventory of critical vet care vents, particularly for adults. Our children's or our pediatric uh, uh, vents will be at BC Children's Hospital, but we are expecting a smaller number, of a relatively small number based on all, of, uh, all other jurisdictions of children requiring uh, ventilators. So uh, with that, you see that uh, we, uh, we have uh, in total uh, 457 adult critical, critical care vents. Uh, 109 of those are in uh, small, smaller hospitals or small hospital vents. And so that leaves us a total of 348 vents in the 17 hospitals that will be our COVID-19 centers, at least at the beginning. Uh, I note that we, uh, as we said yesterday, we added 15 ventilators yesterday that we have purchased. We've refurbished 38 ventilators that are ready to go and 19 other ventilators that will be ready to go next week that will be in addition to the 1272, in addition to the 348. So that's 72 more in those categories. And we also have ordered more ventilators, which we're expecting to come next week. So that gives you a sense of the ventilator capacity in British Columbia. In our conclusions, and you've seen this in the, as we've dealt with the various scenarios, are that using the likely scenario of below or at a Hubei epidemic level using ICU and high acuity unit bed capacity along with vent capacity, we are, we are reasonably focused on being able to handle that within the 17 COVID-19 care sites. If we were to move to a northern Italy trajectory, BC would have to use all sites to meet bed demand and implement increased transportation of patients with between sites. And again, the more detailed discussion of that can be found in the, in the longer briefing. I'm going to move on to the second category of patients in, uh, in the patients in, um, who are in acute care but do not require critical care that based on uh, models uh, around uh, the four models we're using here. You'll find that uh, the expectation here assumes that 13.8 percent of all COVID-19 patients cases will be admitted to hospital. 
Uh, the admissions will commence five, five days, and the range is two to seven days after case identification. And you see the same uh, projections here, and you can see what happened in Italy in particular, where the system was at 100 percent capacity uh, at the time when um, the, uh, the surge of uh, COVID-19 patients uh, came. And so you see the, the extraordinary challenge, and you've seen visually uh, through reporting the enormous challenge that presented for the healthcare system in Italy. It's why we've been, uh, we canceled elective surgeries uh, based on the advice, based on what we were seeing, based on what we were advised, based on projections like this. Um, uh, about uh, 11 days ago now, cancellation of elective surgery and other decanting or moving of, uh, of, for example, alternative level of care patients out of acute care hospitals to create space, not just space to address COVID-19, but, but space to ensure that we're ready for other things and other um, care that will be required in the healthcare system. Again, you see the three levels of chart. You see where BC is now. You see where South, which is uh, uh, closer to where South Korea was. Then you see the effects um, uh, in Hubei, in green, the, and the two Italian models there that we are preparing for. So we're going to summarize uh, um, uh, a bunch of the information that uh, we have. And just uh, to say, and you'll see this, um, uh, we'll see the full package, we'll see um, how we charted this against, uh, the, um, against uh, the various models. And you'll see as the number of patients would rise and as bed requirements rise, uh, on the left you'll see our potential capacity which starts with ICU primary COVID sites and then we add um, the high acuity sites, 50 percent of them, because the other 50 percent will certainly be required for other care and for other, um, um, uh, uh, other care in the healthcare system. So that adds to 263 and then we add uh, 85 percent of the cardiac care unit sites, the cardiac surgery ICU sites, and the post anesthesia recovery rooms in the system to build up our capacity of beds. And then you see as you come down here for South Korea, to the positive, that's how many beds we have more than needed in the various scenarios. And obviously there are some more significant challenges when you get a Northern Italy type situation. Again, in the second Group, the acute care, acute inpatient care demand. You again see a similar, uh, a similar chart which shows us adding beds as required to increase our capacity to deal with COVID-19. And you'll see the big challenges here. And this is why if you look at this, the most serious model, the one, uh, the Northern Italy type epidemic, the hospital-based one, uh, which we do not foresee but which we have to prepare for, you see a shortage of beds here and only here. And uh, in that case, it's why we are preparing in each of our health authorities, in each, in each health authority's significant new bed capacity and preparing for that. Not because we expect it to happen, but, but we have an obligation and we are a determination to be prepared for that to happen. So uh, a few conclusions. Uh, using the likely scenario of below or at a Hubei epidemic level, using inpatient medical and surgical beds, capacity looks good. Uh, focused on using all sites. This has been enabled in large part by the decision made by health authorities and by the government to defer scheduled surgeries, which has opened up significant surge capacity across hospitals. If BC was to move to a northern Italy hospitalized trajectory, BC would use all sites and bed capacity off site from hospitals for less acute and surgical inpatient uh, inpatients to open up additional capacity for COVID-19 patients in hospitals with ready access to critical care. You're going to see that start to happen, those preparations start to happen starting next week with Vancouver Coastal Health and we'll have more information on that. In other words, wh while we are absolutely determined to have the best results, we are preparing um, for the most, um, uh, the worst possible scenarios. We presented a range of scenarios based on evidence from other jurisdictions and a set of grounded, clinically oriented assumptions. As the days of the epidemic pass here in BC, the uh, our, our, the, our needs will become more clear. I think it's fair to say, Dr. Henry, that our epidemiologists would always say that next week they'll be better and the week after they'll be better. And we are going to obviously continue to update this as we go forward. 
Our health authorities are planning for a cascading response, and they're working to find a balance between the needs of potential COVID-19 patients and reducing the risk of unintended consequences on other non-COVID-19 patients needing access to acute and critical care. So as we create new and other options, our intention will be to continue to move other patients out of the hospital uh, if, if, in fact, our hospital begins to face challenges in dealing with uh, critical care and, uh, and overall patient care in the hospitals from COVID-19. So we're putting in place uh, uh, a plan, health authorities, each of them, each of them with their own emergency operations center, are putting in place a plan with their clinical and support staff. They're putting in place a four to six week staffing schedule based on their planning. This will involve redeployment of key clinical staff to support critical care, redeployment of staff to support non-acute inpatient COVID-19 care, accessing additional staff to support both non-acute surgical and medical care, and that includes uh, re-registrants and training, trainee healthcare professionals doing the less, um, the less critical care work, enhancing primary and community care capacity, support and monitor COVID-19 patients who are in self-isolation, and that will be important, and why the innovations in terms of virtual care are so important. Maintaining, and this is critically important, primary and community care needs to meet the health needs of all patients, all non-COVID-19 patients, which of course are continuing to occur, and providing support to clinical care professionals throughout the surge. I want to thank uh, representatives of professional organizations and of unions. We met with them last night for their work and their support and their commitment. They are a critical part of our leadership team, and we are taking steps with them to help address the human resource challenges. And finally, uh, health authorities are also focused on the third aspect, the first being beds and capacity, the second being human resources, the third being personal protective equipment, um, on implementing measures to best use personal protective equipment based on existing at hand and warehouse supplies. We're obviously focused every day, every minute of every day, in fact, on securing additional needed PPE in the coming weeks and throughout the months of April and May. And finally, you know, these are, of course, projections based on different scenarios. And Dr. Henry has spoken about this at length. But it's re what's required to bend the curve, we sometimes saw, what's required to make the projections better is 100% commitment from people everywhere in British Columbia. 100% commitment. The idea that if you're sick, you have to stay home. 100% uh, commitment to the idea if you're required to self-isolate, to self-isolate. 100% commitment to not take un unnecessary trips. 100% commitment. 100% commitment to distancing between one another so that we can continue to bend the curve, that we can ensure that the resources that we've made available in the healthcare system and the passion and commitment and brilliance of our healthcare workers, our doctors and our nurses and our healthcare workers and our pharmacists and everyone else in the system can be used to address the challenge that we f challenges we face in the coming weeks. 100% all in. That's how we change the projection to the better. 100% all in. That's how we deal together with COVID-19 in the coming weeks days and weeks and months. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask Dr. Henry to return um, uh, here as she has a couple of additional announcements uh, that are relevant today and an additional order to uh, describe and then we'll be open to taking your questions. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is uh, a lot of work summarized in a very small uh, amount of time uh, with uh, a few graphs that uh, it don't begin to describe the amount of thinking that has gone into this. And I think the importance as well is engaging across the entire health sector on understanding what we can do and how we can do it together to protect the health system and to protect our communities in doing that. Um, today, though, I, there's one other order. Um, I'm issuing uh, the following order. All episodic uh, vending markets, what we know as farmers markets or community markets, must only allow vendors that ser um, serve food to be sold at these events. So vendors of all other merchandise at these events are prohibited. And this is recognition of how important it is for us to be able to access locally grown and produced food. And the farmers markets are an important part of that. Um, but we don't want them to be areas 
where people are going and um, mingling in large groups uh, because the, of the risk right now that that entails. I will recognize, though, that the Ministry of Agriculture is working with the BC Association of Farmers Markets to make sure that we can um, have online um, models for farmers markets that will still allow us to get that fresh fruit and produce that we need here in British Columbia through this crisis. So I think it's, a, it's an understatement really to say, but our global community has changed in ways we could not have imagined even a few weeks ago. And the modeling, the thinking that we've been doing really reflects that. But we are in this together and we are making a difference in bending that curve and we need to get us through this together by all of us being committed to continuing to do this, to being kind, to staying connected even though we are physically distant. And we'll be happy to take your questions now.